Hello once again, ladies and gentlemen. This will be a talk on the omnipresent irritable bowel syndrome. You're going to see this commonly in the clinic, and you can bet that you're going to get asked a question on this on your exam. And the reason is because this is one of the uh, more common causes of chronic abdominal pain, which is abdominal pain that lasts for longer than three months. There's a big differential for that. And so um, IBS is traditionally regarded as a diagnosis of exclusion. Gastroenterologists may take issue with that, but for your exam, it is really a diagnosis of exclusion. Uh, but in order to make a diagnosis of exclusion, we need to rule out a lot of things. And there are, in fact, a lot of things. So we're going to go over the differential of chronic abdominal pain. And really, uh, this is going to be just as much about chronic abdominal pain as it is about irritable bowel syndrome. If you haven't had the opportunity yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. I've got the link below in the description of the video, or you can click on the I button on the upper right hand corner up there. If you can consider chipping in a dollar a month, a little bit really goes a long way uh, to help offset the cost of these videos. So I thank you very much in advance for your consideration. All right, so we are going to uh, go through a vignette and see how this commonly presents. Uh, we'll kind of go through the workup and approach of a patient with chronic abdominal pain. We'll uh, go through the differential diagnosis for chronic abdominal pain. Now, it's a big list, but you'll be able to narrow down a lot of the things just by you know history and physical. Even just the patient's gender will narrow down some of that stuff sometimes. Uh, we'll go through the Rome 4 criteria. Um, there's another set of criteria that's used for IBS, depending on what you prefer, called the Manning criteria. But USMLE tends to stick with the Rome criteria. So that's going to be uh, what we discuss here. And then we'll go over management. All right, so we got a 27-year-old woman coming into the outpatient clinic complaining of crampy abdominal pain for the last four months. She's unable to point to a specific location and says that it just hurts all over. She's tried over-the-counter antacids, which has not helped. The pain comes and goes, but is present most of the day. She says that the only thing that helps is when she defecates. She says that she defecates around five times a day, and they are occasionally loose but not watery. She denies any changes in stool color. Family history is insignificant for autoimmune diseases, GI diseases, or early cancers. She denies weight loss or fevers. She has a past medical history of generalized anxiety disorder, which has been adequately treated with sertraline for the last two years. No surgical history and vitals are within normal limits. Okay, so the chief complaint here is crampy abdominal pain times four months. So we know we're dealing with chronic abdominal pain. Now we've got a big differential, but what are some things we want to rule out? Well, we really want to rule out IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, because that tends to present around this age. So what are some things that really help us rule that out? Well, first of all, uh, she doesn't notice any changes in stool color. That's good. Uh, she does have loose stools, but she doesn't really have any of the feverish symptoms, a weight loss, sort of those constitutional symptoms that we typically associate with chronic inflammation. So that's good. Now, another thing that really points to irritable bowel syndrome, and you want to pay attention to this, is that it is helped, the pain is helped, it gets better when she defecates. That is very, very common with IBS. So for your exam, you need to know that. If you don't take anything else from this talk, uh, I just want you to know that with IBS, it tends to get better with defecation. That's very characteristic. So she does also have a past medical history of generalized anxiety disorder. We're going to see that there are a lot of psychiatric comorbidities with uh, IBS. Um, now, whether that's the cause or if it's a result of the, uh, of the IBS, you know, we don't really know, but there is a strong link. Um, now, one thing is that she is being treated with sertraline. Now, sertraline can cause diarrhea. Uh, but it's typically transient, and it certainly doesn't last two years. And uh, 
she's only had this issue for four months and she was on the sertraline uh, for much longer. So you may get something like that thrown at you on the exam as a distractor. Okay, so the approach to chronic abdominal pain. Uh, as I've mentioned, IBS is a diagnosis of exclusion, so uh, you need to exclude other causes of long-standing abdominal pain, either through clinical or laboratory evaluation. Chronic abdominal pain is defined as abdominal pain that persists for more than three months, either continuous or intermittent. So it's got to be some kind of abdominal pain that, you know, it's just not going away. Maybe it's not all the time, but it just comes on uh, and there's really nothing that uh, that that causes it that they they know of. Um, so, you know, it's not like, you know, you're getting Mexican food every couple days and you get abdominal pain from that, you know, where it's linked to something that is really obvious that you're doing. This is just sort of abdominal pain that comes and goes and you don't really know why. That's chronic abdominal pain. Now, important factors uh, to get in the history when you've got a patient coming in with abdominal pain for more than three months is, first of all, the location of the pain. That's going to give you really big hints as to what the cause is. If they've got right upper quadrant pain, you're thinking much different things than if they got left lower quadrant pain or left or right lower quadrant pain. So you need to get that. Uh, you need to know the quality of the pain. Sharp and stabbing is probably going to be a slightly different differential from achy and crampy. Uh, the timing is going to be really important for your differential. So does this come on post-prandially, uh, so after eating? Is it pre-prandial and gets better with eating? Does it kind of cycle with menstruation? Uh, you want to know those things. You want to know the frequency. Uh, how often are you getting these episodes? Sometimes they're all the time. It's constantly there. And then anything that worsens the pain, particularly we're thinking of milk and wheat products here, or anything like medications that help relieve the pain. All right, so you want to ask about stool quality. Um, is it watery? Is it hard? Is it normal? Uh, what is it like? You want to ask about stool frequency. Always, always, always. That's important. How many times per day are you defecating? And that's going to be important just in distinguishing uh, constipation versus diarrhea because you can get either or or you can get both in the context of IBS. We want to know other factors in the GI review of systems. So are you having regurgitation and heartburn, GERD symptoms? Are you throwing up? Are you feeling bloated? Are you having lots of flatulence? Uh, are you having any changes in your appetite? We definitely want to know about constitutional symptoms. So are you having fever? Have you lost any weight without trying? Uh, are you waking up with sweats at night? Stuff like that. And then we want to know history of abdominal surgery. And that's just looking for the possibility that there may be obstruction due to adhesions. Essential labs. Now, if you ever work with a gastroenterologist, they pretty much always, the first thing they do when uh, they get consulted is get a stool analysis. So fecal fat, looking for malabsorption, blood, looking for inflammation, ovum parasites, looking for infectious causes, culture, fecal calprotectin, which is useful for uh, distinguishing the possibility of IBD and acetyl toxin if there's an antibiotic history. Uh, you want to get a CBC, you want to get a BMP, looking for electrolyte issues, you want to get a serum calcium. Why? Because hypercalcemia, what's the mnemonic? Groans, abdominal groans. You get pain with abdominal pain with hypercalcemia. You want to get liver function tests because abdominal pain can be caused by liver issues. You want to get a TSH, and you want to get a urinalysis. So all of these are very essential labs uh, that uh, you're always going to want to get in a patient with chronic abdominal pain. And then you may get other tests depending on the patient's specific presentation. Now, the American College of Gastroenterologists recommend a routine ser serology screening for patients that have suspected IBS. So you're talking about your anti-tissue transglutaminase, anti-gliadin, um, and those things. So I doubt that will come up on the exam, but that's what they recommend. All right, so what's our differential look like? Well, you want to know the nature of the pain. 
So what makes it worse? What makes it better? Are there constitutional signs? Is she a woman? Um, and so, okay, well, what if it's made worse with eating? Well, there's a lot of things there. So it could be GERD. GERD tends to have regurgitation and vomiting. You don't really see that in IBS alone. Gastric ulcer, that can cause pain. That will tend to be relieved by antacids. Uh, lactase deficiency, well, what's going to make that worse? Milk products. So you want to ask about what kinds of things make this worse. If she says, I get abdominal pain after I drink a glass of milk, and you probably know what you're dealing with. Celiac disease, uh, so that's associated with, uh, with wheat products. They tend to have a malabsorptive diarrhea because they've got a lot of inflammation in their small bowel. Um, and then they'll typically have some weight loss too, not because of the inflammation, but because they're not absorbing fat properly. Chronic pancreatitis, look for a history of a repeated episodes of acute pancreatitis, usually in an alcoholic. They also tend to have a malabsorptive diarrhea. Uh, amylase and lipase can be useful for distinguishing that, but not always. Cholelithiasis, that tends to be right upper quadrant. Chronic mesenteric ischemia, look for an older patient, peripheral artery disease, atherosclerosis. They tend to lose weight, again, not because of malabsorption here or because of inflammation, but because eating is so painful that they just avoid eating altogether. If it's relieved with eating, that tends to point to a duodenal ulcer. Remember that when you eat, the first part of your small bowel, the duodenum, releases, uh, receives uh, bicarb, and that tends to soothe the ulcer. Gynecologic causes, I don't want to go into this too much, but pelvic inflammatory disease, look for a history of STIs or IUD use, pain with sex, tenderness on uh, pelvic examination, they usually have a high white count. Endometriosis is usually pain that cycles with periods. Ectopic pregnancy, always a good thing to rule out when you're dealing with any kind of belly pain. Uh, usually, though, that's less than three months of duration. And then an ovarian cyst can usually be discerned on a uh, pelvic exam. Now, if it's relieved by defecation, that really points to IBS. Now, IBS is our diagnosis of exclusion. We're going to come to that uh, in a little bit. But remember what I said, IBS, very heavily associated with pain relief with defecation. And if there's constitutional symptoms like weight loss and stuff, or if there's extra intestinal signs like pyoderma gangrenosum and erythema nodosum and iritis and all that stuff, then you got to be thinking of IBD. These patients usually have blood in their stool, so that will come up on stool exam. There is a change in stool quality like in IBS, but there's often all these other things too. And I do a talk on IBD, so you can go back and watch that for more details. All right, what are our Rome 4 criteria? They're fairly easy to remember. So recurrent abdominal pain, it's got to be at least one day a, a week uh, over the past three months, and they've got to have two or more of these criteria. It's got to be related to defecation, namely it improves with defecation. It's associated with a change in frequency of bowel movement, so they're pooping more or they're pooping less. Uh, and it's associated with a change in form or appearance of stool. So usually if they got diarrhea, it looks liquidy. If they've got constipation, it can be kind of, I don't know what the word is, globular. Um, it's very dry, hard to pass. So that's your Rome 4 criteria. All right, so management. Uh, really the cornerstone of management, what we want all patients to do is have a high soluble fiber diet. Now, soluble fiber is different from just your regular old dietary fiber. So, so you, you really want them to stick to soluble fiber. Uh, it just works better for dealing with these symptoms. Uh, so uh, we're looking here at like psyllium and oat bran and beans and barley as opposed to wheat bran and whole grains. Uh, so you want them to know which fiber to eat, not just any fiber, but soluble fiber. 20 to 30 grams a day. That's hard to get in unless you're trying. Average American is way deficient in their fiber. Uh, only 10% of Americans get their uh, full recommended amount of fiber. And usually those ones are either trying or they've got some sort of special diet like they're vegetarians or something like that. Uh, exercise is good. It just helps with uh, abdominal movement and kind of moving things along there, particularly for the patients with constipation. 
adequate fluid intake, and avoidance of caffeine. Caffeine tends to make these symptoms worse. Then you want to tailor your medical management uh, to the predominant stooling habits. So if they're predominant diarrhea, we call that IBSD, uh, then you would want to use something like an opioid agonist, uh, loperamide, uh, also uh, called Imodium. Uh, that is particularly useful. If they have IBS-C, then you're looking at more bulking agents like psyllium. Now you might think, okay, uh, well, psyllium, we talked about fiber, right? So why would we recommend fiber in somebody with IBS-D? Doesn't fiber make you poop? And that is true, it does. It also uh, is really good at uh, absorbing extra water uh, that's in your gut. Um, so that it doesn't come out as diarrhea, it comes out as formed. So fiber is just really good at keeping you regular. It, if you've got diarrhea, it's good at hardening your stools. If you've got constipation, it's good at getting them out. Okay, so bulking agents are what we look for with IBSC. There's a few other drugs, lubiprostone, uh, which is uh, works with prostaglandins. Uh, I'm not going to go into mechanisms here. Linaclotide, which works on uh, chloride channels and increases water secretion into the small bowel. Uh, Tegacerod, polyethylene glycol, and tricyclic antidepressants. Now, tricyclic antidepressants are useful for two reasons. Uh, they can help with depression, uh, which is tightly linked to uh, IBS, and they also uh, alter intestinal motility. Antispasmodics. So uh, with the antispasmodics, um, traditionally we go for these. However, the most recent recommendations from the American College of Gastroenterologists, and remember, they are not God, they're just one organization, uh, they recommend against it. So I don't know if that's going to come up on your exam, but traditionally antispasmodics are used. Uh, rifaximin can be can be used as well, and these are typically used for pain. So we call those the you know the pain and bloating and stuff. Uh, we call those global symptoms of IBS. So that's usually what it's used for. And then peppermint oil, interestingly enough, has been shown as a relatively effective agent for those global symptoms, uh, and that has been recommended by the American College of Gastroenterologists. So, you know, peppermint oil is one of those things that gastroenterologists have a love-hate relationship with. It can be really irritating on the stomach. It can make um, some GI symptoms worse, but it just so happens that peppermint oil uh, is potentially useful for IBS. So some pearls here from me, uh, irritable bowel syndrome has a pretty tight association with psychiatric comorbidities. You'll want to know that for your exam. They may give you a patient with a history of psychiatric issues. IBS is almost always poorly localized. So if the abdominal pain is localized to a specific quadrant, you may want to consider other causes. On test questions, they're almost always going to tell you that the pain is somewhat relieved with defecation. So although this does not guarantee a diagnosis of IBS, it's very suggestive on your board questions. You always got to keep looking out for those alarm features like weight loss. That's going to warrant a colonoscopy because not only are you looking for potentially things like colon cancer, uh, but that's really a sign that you may be dealing with a Crohn's or a UC. And then finally, the American College of Gastroenterologists does recommend serologic testing for celiac disease in any patient that shows up with symptoms consistent with IBSD. And that is it. Uh, here are my sources in case you're interested, and I'll see you next time.